So in our previous video on how memory worked, we got to the point from storing one bit of information that we could set or reset it to the flip-flop where we could store a bit of information and then we arranged four of them together in parallel so we could store four bits of information. So what we did, we had four inputs, D0 to D3, which gave us our input, and four outputs, Q0 to Q3, which gave us our output. And we connected for each of the flip-flops the clock input together so that when we strobed this input, it stored all the information on the data inputs and presented it out at the output. This has still only allowed us to store one piece of information. It was a bigger piece. We could store here a number between 0 and 15, or if we use 2's complement, between minus 8 and 7. But it was still only one piece of information. So what we're going to look at now is how we can arrange flip-flops so we can store more than one piece of information. So actually, if you're implementing a memory chip like this one, which is a 8K by 8-bit memory chip, you wouldn't use flip-flops as we've seen them before. You'd actually arrange about six transistors to store each bit, just so that you could fit more onto the actual silicon. If you put flip-flops as we design them on, they take up more space. Also, we're not going to consider, like this is an 8-bit wide bit of memory, or a byte wide memory, we'll still consider one bit. So we're only going to store one bit of information, but we're going to store multiple different bits. If you did want to store eight bits of information, you could just have eight chips one for each bit that you wanted to store. So I'm just going to use the flip-flop symbol that we had before to represent it. So we've got our data input, which we'll call D. We've got our output Q. We've also got the inverted Q output. And we have our clock input as well that we can use to tell it to store it. So whatever's on the input is stored in the flip-flop and goes to the output when we take this low and then take it high again, or vice versa, depending on how it's actually built. Now, we want to store more than one bit of information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to store two bits of information. So I have another flip-flop, exactly the same. So now we have two bits of information. Now there's several things we need to do. We want to have one input to our system. So we have one data bit that we're going to store. And we want to be able to choose whether we store it in this flip-flop or in that flip-flop. Well, the first thing we need is some way of saying which flip-flops value we're actually interested in storing. The CPU refers to every single memory location by a unique identifier. But rather than having a name like we get in the programming language, the computer uses a binary number to refer to each memory location. This is what we would call the address. So in this case, I'm going to say this is at address 0, and this one is at address 1. So now I want to be able to access either this one or this one. Well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have a data input, which I'm going to call D in here. And that's where we're going to put our signal. Now, if we think about how flip-flop works, they only change the value they store when we strobe the clock input. So actually, we can connect to the input directly to the input of the first flip-flop. And we can also connect it directly to the input of the second flip-flop, like so. So how do we choose which one we want to store in? Well, we could have, in this case, two strobe lines and just strobe the right one. Well, that would work fine for two bits, and it wouldn't be too bad if we had four flip-flops. But if you think about it, if you've got 64 kilobits of memory, that's 65,536 different wires. And so it gets unmanageable when you get to high numbers. So what we do is we say, well, actually, we're going to have an input, which we'll call A in the address input, and if this is 0, then we're going to refer to this one. And if this contains 1, we're going to refer to this one. We'll also have a signal W, which we'll use to say we want to write whatever bit is in D in to whichever flip-flop is specified by A in. So what we want to do is to be able to strobe the input to the 0 flip-flop clock pin when A in contains 0 and W is strobed, or strobe the input on the one flip-flop when A in contains one and W is strobed. So we need to connect via digital logic again these inputs to the clock input of flip-flop zero or the clock input of flip-flop one. And to do that, we use our old friend, the AND gate again. I'm going to start with flip-flop one because it's the simpler one to think about how we do this. We want this clock input to be strobed when W is strobed and a in contains a 1. And so the easiest way to do that, if you remember our AND gates, and you can look back at some of the videos on number file if you've forgotten about them. This is a 
AND gate. So if we put an AND gate in here, we draw that like so. Now if we think about an AND gate again, it's got two inputs, A and B, and an output, which again we'll use Q. So if we look here, we see that whenever A is 1, the output matches B. So when A is 1 and B is 0, the output is 0. When A is 1 and B is 1, the output is 1. So we can use this fact, these values here, in our circuit here. We want clock to be whatever the value of W is, which we've connected to input B on the AND gate, whenever the input A in is 1. So we can just connect that line directly in like that. And so now whenever we strobe W, the clock input on flip-flop 1 will only be strobed if A in contains 1, or the address 1. Now, how do we do the same for flip-flop 0? Well, we want the same thing to happen, so I shall bring my wires down here. So what we need to do now is work out what are going to be the right inputs for A and B on this AND gate. Now, the input for B is easy because it's exactly the same as this one here. The W signal, the right signal, the same we want to write it. We just bring this down and connect it up. But we need this thing to be 1 whenever A in is 0. So the way we do that, again, remembering your digital logic, is that we use a simple NOT gate, like this, which just inverts it. So when the input to the NOT gate is 0, the output is 1. When the input to the NOT gate is 1, the output is 0. So we can connect this in like so. And so now what we've got set up is that we've got three inputs. W, which says when we want to write something to our flip-flops. D in, which contains the value we want to write. And A in, which tells us whether we want to write to flip-flop 0 or flip-flop 1. Depending on the value of 0 or 1 in A in, we either store the value in that one or we store it in that one. And of course you can expand this up too complicated to draw it, but if you wanted to store, say, 4, you'd have two A inputs. So you'd have A0, which would contain bit 0 of your binary input, and you'd have A1, which would contain bit 1. And of course, remember, your binary inputs would then be A1 and A0, and so you'd be able to refer to 0, 0, which would give you location 0 again, 0, 1, which would give you address 1, 1, 0, which would give you address 2, and 1, 1, which would give you address 3. And all we need to do is build up a more complicated circuit which combined A0 and A1, or not A0 and not A1, with the W signal to connect to each of these flip-flops. So that's how we would do the writing to one. We can choose whichever flip-flop we want by the address, and then we can strobe the W thing to write it to that one or that one. But what about reading? How do we combine the two outputs from our flip-flops into a single output? The ARM system in the first Archimedes would run reliably well above 100 degrees C. This is just the half adder. We want a binary full adder.